this presentation is about foot binding in China. The custom lasts uh, just under a thousand years, starting in the Tang or, or maybe early Song dynasty up until the end of the Qing dynasty in 1911. And uh, by the end of this period, our estimates are about 85% of Han Chinese women were or had been bound at some time. This custom is, in addition to being body modification, it's, it's uh, mysterious for a few other reasons. Matteo Ricci uh, never mentions it in his original reportage. Um, and uh, in addition, most Chinese men were somewhat unfamiliar with some of the workings of the process. The goals of this presentation are, are three. First, I just want to inform you a little bit about some of the features of foot binding. Two, I will explain a couple of the scientific theories uh, about, the, about this practice. And then lastly, we'll conclude with some, some questions that might help adjudicate between the two theories. So for the first part, in the context of this card conference, it seems especially important to remark on the process as it's physically instantiated. So as you see pictured here, it involves several steps. I mean, I think traditionally there were sort of seven steps involved but they're more or less all captured in, in these or, 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 or related kinds of ideas. The foot is washed and cleaned and soaked. It's bandaged. Uh, in particular, the tightness of the bandage over the bottom of the feet was important because the toes get wrapped under the sole. And eventually this is tied off and various other uh, Chinese traditional medicinals could be used in the process to make this a little more efficient. And this was repeated once or twice uh, per week, if people could afford it. In addition to the process, there were lots of other physical uh, effects uh, of being bound. Um, probably one of the most important is that women who had God level upper upper, like high, we'll get to that in a second, like highly ranked bound feet, the golden lotus foot, um, typically they were in need of walking on the posterior surface of their heel rather than uh, rather than on this um, interior interior portion. So the angle of their metatarsals uh, relative to the rest of their back foot was very high. The foot becomes quite pitched. Normally for natural footed folks, um, the angle of the, the forefoot and metatarsals is about 30 to 40 degrees. And in footbound women, this this uh, increases to between 60 and 80 degrees, according to some work on um, autopsy uh, feet that were footbound. Um, so, among other things, uh, these physical changes to the foot led to a number of medical and osteopathic concerns. Uh, women who were footbound had higher rates of osteoporosis. Um, their toes were much more likely to be infected, often with gangrene. Um, and they experience a great deal of muscular atrophy, which in turn leads to falls and knock-on injuries. Um, in addition, in, in osteopathic research, the bone stiffness, uh, a technical measure of foot-bound women, was quite low um, in, their, in, their, in all leg bones, really. Um, and their, their mineral bone density was also extraordinarily low. So estimates from the Qing period... Uh, were that according to Gao, 2007, one of the rare Chinese authored recent books about foot binding, he suggests that one or two in 10 were likely to die from foot binding during that period, and seven or eight out of 10 were injured. As a consequence of these physical features of the process and their effects, there were knock on implications for walking and mobility. Um, <clears throat> one of the most uh, uh, sad, I guess, um, consequences was reported by snow 1984 in her book she writes that during the war of japanese aggression in china uh women who were footbound quote were actually dying because they could hardly walk their feet were stops unquote they couldn't flee um, <clears throat> the troops so on top of the physical features uh, uh through which um the body was modified in these ways there were lots of cultural touchstones to the practice um, there were, um, it was, it was an elite practice, which seems to have resonated through Chinese history as a aspirational feature of foot binding. The foot binding was widely reputed to be a net burden on Chinese women. 
Um, and it was the source of just untold buckets of tears across various lineages. It was, it was not, um, it was not an easy process to be, have done to you nor to do to your own daughter or granddaughter. In addition, uh, footbound feet were hypercognized sexually by men. Um, and, uh, you know, so much so that there are historical records indicating there were beauty pageants, like foot beauty pageants in certain counties in, uh, in Northern China, especially. And even today, it's still a very sensitive issue. I mean, it may not be career ending, but it's, uh, it still has an aspect of scandal and embarrassment. And this is in part responsible for a wave of what you might think of as a revisionist histories of foot minding in which the, the practice is kind of redeemed uh, for maybe its benefits or cultural meaning. So this, uh, this hypersexualized feature of foot binding, um, it, fascinating on its own. I don't plan to talk about that other than illustrating that there were various historical, um, historically influential records suggesting like fairly detailed ranking systems for foot binding. And this is of practical importance. These are not merely used at the foot beauty pageants. These are instead routinely used by, well, uh, frequently used by, uh, matchmakers. Uh, in fact, matchmakers would very often ask for a, f a, a, a shoe of a possible bride to be, so they could show the groom's family, um, <clears throat> the dimensions of the foot. All right. This leads us to scientific explanations. There are two major scientific explanations. Um, the first one, according to the labor market hypothesis, basically, um, this is a kind of a neo-Marxist approach to the issue and parents, uh, being selfish are attempting to extract, uh, value out of the alienated labor of their daughters. And that you might think, well, how does this make sense? Why is foot biting necessary for that? The idea here is that girl and, and to quote, um, Melissa Brown, uh, girls like to run and play and when they're bound, they can't. So you can sit them down or strap them into uh, a spinning wheel or later in life alone. In contrast, the evolutionary sciences hypothesis puts a more um, uh, maybe biological spin on this. In effect, um, parents wanted girls, their girls to marry up and socioeconomic status. This was good for the girl. It was good for the possible grandparents out of the marriage. It was then good for the parents and grandparents of the, the bride. So this led to hypergamy and uh, is, is an outcome of gene culture co-evolution. The labor market advocates are pictured here. Um, they've written collectively like hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of words about this process. They've done um, primary research in China with uh, footbound or formerly footbound people. This started as early as maybe 1991 by Hell Gates. The theory has a bunch of implications. I'll just highlight a couple of each theory. The most important here is that it's motivated by profit. So this suggests that it can be tested with respect to the psychological um, attitudes or beliefs of parents of footbound girls. And um, authors explicitly say that it's not correlated with hypergamy. Footbound girls were not more likely to marry up in socioeconomic status than were non-footbound girls. For the evolutionary sciences hypothesis, we can just focus on the hypergamy issue. This is precisely what this hypothesis is predicting. Parents are in, uh, there's, there's mate competition and there's parental competition. So here parents are competing with other parents to have the best grandparent grandchildren. And they can do that in part by marrying daughters hypergamously. So I tend to split up the explananda here, the scientific explananda into origins, maintenance, and um, cessation. And each theory has its own views about each, each of the three components of a full, well-rounded explanation of foot binding. So <clears throat> as far as origins, the labor market uh, folks have identified some, the historical period as, and, and the historical location of the alleged origins as being uh, a very focal time period for the development of textiles in Chinese history. In terms of maintenance, this is simply, as I mentioned, the foot binding was used as, as a means of, of getting girls to work, um, in, typically in handicrafts like spinning. And lastly, in terms of cessation, the labor market theory um, suggests that um, the, the practice ends in the early 20th century because the value of girls spinning or other handicraft labor dropped to the bottom once railroads were constructed. And here, 
the further causal connection is that when railroads were moving into interior China, they brought very cheap manufactured textiles. In terms of the evolutionary theory, <clears throat> the origins, they're basically about hypergamy, but into hypergamy feed other variables that are familiar from evolutionary psychology, such as parent, uh, paternal certainty. If uh, a woman is unable to walk, then um, it's very unlikely that she will cheat on the man. And that, that feeds into uh, the role of mate guarding, foot binding, if foot binding's role in mate guarding. Uh, in terms of maintenance, foot binding is commonplace and for a lot of different reasons, not least the economic stagnation and the very, the very stark economic stratification throughout Chinese history. Um, but cultural factors play a role. Here is this incongruous picture of the day that Sweden switched from driving on the left to driving on the right. Um, driving on the left or the right is a self-reinforcing custom because if you violate that custom, you're going to die or you're going to lose your car or you're going to pay a lot of insurance costs, etc. Foot binding is like that. Parents who were foot binding daughters feared that if they didn't do so, then they would be forced to um, never have grandkids. Okay, so this leads to cessation and the external pressures on cessation. Um, so, sorry, here the evolutionary approach suggests that Western Christian Christian missionaries uh, who created natural foot societies provided this external shock to a, a, a very culturally embedded tradition. And the, this natural, the role of the natural foot societies is in part that to be a member, uh, a Han Chinese person needed to pledge that they wouldn't bind their daughter's feet and they wouldn't marry their son to a, a foot bound uh, woman. All of a sudden, once those were subscribed to by ethnically Han Chinese people, there were large pools of potential mates for their, for, for their daughters and it reduced the need to foot bind according to this explanation. So very briefly, we can turn to assessment. I just wanted to mention first, there are a lot of, a lot of possible ways we could try to test hypotheses some are psychological, economic, um, broadly, you know, uh, mating related, um, and some have to do with cessation. We don't need to go into great detail about these right now. And, and in addition, there are numbers of problems uh, as we look through, through um, possible methods of testing. One is that um, the, the two theories make some very similar predictions, but they still at least have enough differences to work with. The two theories... Um, seem to have challenges identifying what it is to explain foot binding, which is why I suggest that we break this into three parts. Data is very scarce. As mentioned, um, s there's a lot of research on this, but no publicly accessible large-scale historical data set. And even the labor market team's own data has, has not yet been released for public use. So here, it, it led me and my team to turn to methodological innovations. That's really what we, um, we kind of, we had a choice forced upon us. And so what we've done is we've created an agent-based model to look at foot binding. This was a publication from 2022. Uh, we focused in particular on cessation, the period of cessation, because that's where the most uh, amount of data is available. Um, in addition to that, uh, I've written a more of a methodological piece um, evaluating some of the some of the features of the labor market explanation that didn't quite seem right. Um, so I will avoid going into any significant detail about the model, but suffice it to say that um, this was informed by a great deal of very detail-oriented historiographic work using uh, publicly available data from from the last thousand years that helped us identify, say, the number of adult sons that a family would have, or the percent of family wealth that was produced through handicraft labor of daughters, along with things like the overall rate of polygyny, which is quite important for the evolutionary sciences approach on the grounds that um, polygyny ends up creating a lot more um, comp make competition since a daughter can always be married up if a rich person takes on yet another wife. So I'll save further questions about this for the Q&A period. And in the meantime, I can turn to thanking both Carta for this generous invitation to participate in this project and to both Ilo Chang and Laura Smith Chowdhury for all the work they've done both on the historical side and on the modeling side to make um, our research a success. Thank you.